I bought a farm in Pumalanga 21 years ago to semi-retire first and uh, planning to retire later. And just along with a whole lot of other uh, animals, I bought five white rhino. You started with five 21 years ago. How many have you got today? I think Aki alluded to that a bit earlier. Yeah, I currently have over 900 rhino. And have you lost any animals to poaching? Yes, I've lost 12 rhinos to poaching. A very dramatic thing to happen to you. Well, we've seen in the last couple of years, there's been an exponential growth in the amount or the number of rhino that were poached from seven and 13 in 2010, all the way up to 668 last year. And this year, we over 500 animals already we've lost to poaching. Why, why do you think this is happening, John? That's very easy to understand if you study the situation. First of all, they were wiping out all the rhinos in Africa. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, we stood by with folded arms while they were wiping out the rhinos of Africa. The consumers, the demand then came to South Africa in the early 2000s. Here they found that they could buy horn legally within the country. And uh, they did. They acquired horn from farmers who had rhinos die or who dehorned rhinos. And um, they found that they could also legally hunt rhinos in this country. And they found uh, farmers that were prepared to dehorn their rhinos and sell rhinos, so rhino horn to them. Then in 2009, we introduced an internal moratorium which banned the sale of rhino horn within the country. But even that didn't stop the supply to the east because people still went on supplying illegal rhinos to the demand in the east, or illegal rhino horn, rather, to the demand in the east. And uh, only a year or two later, we had some spectacular arrests in this country and prosecutions for dealing illegally in rhino horn. And that closed down the supply from South Africa. And that supply was replaced by rhinos, rhino horn from poachers, and slowly but surely it's moved to Mozambique, who are operating mostly out of the Kruger Park. But basically, we closed our doors to business, and the, uh, the demand found poachers to supply that demand. Now, in conservation circles, uh, it's well known that you advocate legalizing the trade in rhino horn. Do you think that could mitigate poaching at all? There's no doubt in my mind that they could, they could do that. Don't forget, that demand is there. We have failed. It's been there for hundreds and probably thousands of years. And we have so far failed completely to stop the demand. But we have stopped the supply. So I believe if there was a legal, ethical source to supply them with rhino horn that came from rhinos that were not killed, to supply the horn. I believe that we would then stand a chance. But currently, completely refusing to supply them with approximately 20-odd ton we have in this country means that they will continue to deal with the poachers. And don't forget, rhino horn grows again. So we can dehorn it, and it can grow again. Now, there are many different tools in the toolbox that conservationists use to try and stop poaching. Uh, one of them is dehorning. Can you take us through dehorning, a typical dehorning process? Dehorning is a very simple process. The rhino is tranquilized. The horn is cut off above the quick, just like you would cut your toenail or your fingernail without hitting the quick. So therefore it is painless, but obviously because he's a wild animal, he's restrained with uh, tranquilizing, the operation <coughs> takes 15 to 18 minutes. So, <coughs> does the horn regrow then again after it's been taken off? The horn regrows on average about 10 centimeters a year. So, how much horn can you get from, typically from an animal in its lifetime? A female produces about a kilo of horn a year, a male about two kilos. They live for 40 and possibly even 45 years. So, we could... Uh, get from a female rhino in her life, while she's breeding calves, 
we could probably easily get 40 kilos and from <coughs> a male 60, anything up to 80 kilos during his lifetime. So do you consider yourself a farmer then or, or a conservationist? I am both, yeah. I believe. Uh, I think a conservationist is somebody who makes it possible for animals to thrive and increase in numbers and uh, it is basically a farming practice. So I think I am both. What role do you think that private rhino owners and breeders play in conserving rhino? I think they play a very important part. If you think that 30 to 40 years ago there were no rhinos in private hands in this country, I think the private owners can probably, with resources, protect their rhinos better than the public sector. But we need to make it viable for them to want to breed more animals. There's obviously a substantial amount of money to be made from breeders like yourself, by breeders like yourself, rather, uh, if the trade is being legalized. And, and cynics are saying uh, in conservation circles, well, John Hume is only in it uh, for the money. Would you care to comment on that? My passion and mission in life is to save the rhinos from extinction. In order to do that, we must increase the rate of breeding them, and we must decrease the rate of killing them. Now, in order to increase the rate of breeding them, you must make it attractive to communities, to the, uh, the farming sector, to want to breed rhino. And what better way of making it attractive for him to breed rhino, what better way than to give him a financial incentive to be able to do that. So I don't mind those people pointing fingers at me. It is a fact that I'm vulnerable to it because I'm the biggest rhino breeder and, re and, and, and rhino owner, biggest private rhino breeder and owner in the world. So I am vulnerable to that finger pointing. But quite frankly, that is what the rhino needs. The rhino needs to incentivize people to, to breed them. It's also interesting that you mentioned communities uh, a moment ago in the same, in talking about involvement. I know you're also an advocate of involving communities in conservation of rhino. The communities at the moment only supply a fertile ground for the recruitment of poachers. Communities could be excellent farmers of rhino. <coughs> they have been excellent farmers of cattle for centuries. We could encourage them by giving them rhinos, by allowing them to sell the horn and regrow it and sell it again and regrow it and sell it again. And in that way, they could generate a very good income to run their clinics, schools, etc. And they could become nowhere near as impoverished as they are now. And they would guard those rhinos with their very lives, so they would become unfertile ground for the recruitment of poachers. Now, detractors of using legalizing trade to conserve rhinos are saying it's not going to work. Are there any examples you can tell us about where, in fact, legalizing trade has worked of an endangered species? The vacuna in South America is the uh, easiest comparison, parallel with the rhinos. The vacuna is a very small llama-like animal, uh, which has the second finest wool fiber in the world. Centuries ago, there were hundreds of thousands of them in five or six countries in South America. The modus operandi to get the wool into a, a garment was to shoot the animal, send the pelt to Italy where it was fashioned into a garment, a very expensive garment, and um, eventually the vacunas got down to 6,000. They were uh, then protected by CITES, but very shortly after that, with an agreement with CITES, they learned to share the wool off the vacuna instead of killing it. So they shared the wool, they still made the fabrics, the communities got money, they got salaries, they got clinics, they got schools, and the vacunas were kept alive. 
Currently, there are back to well over 300,000 vacunas in South America, all in about 35 years. Getting back to the rhino horn trade, who, who buys this and what are they using it for? It's been used for centuries in the East, uh, a host of different uh, uses, mostly as a status symbol. Even the jewelry made from it is a status symbol. Uh, ornaments, lots of uh, ways, but mostly it is a status symbol. The, um, the medicinal use is actually fairly minor in terms of the amount of rhino used there. But our problem is that the demand has been there for many, many centuries and we are failing to stop that demand completely. So we must find a way of supplying them that demand without killing the rhino. Given the situation which appears to be out of control completely as far as poaching a rhino is concerned, what is your vision for yourself firstly and then for the rhino? Well, my vision is to go on breeding more and more rhino to combat this dramatic uh, reduction of, nu of numbers that we are due to, to have over the next few years. And again, it needs money. It needs money, and what better way to get that money than not to kill the animal, but sell the horn in order to buy more ground, more food, and eventually increase the numbers of rhino dramatically, and hopefully restock the rest of Africa with rhino. John, and finally, how important do you think it is to develop communication strategies with consumer states and consumer countries? I think it's very important. We need to get them to understand that they must stop killing our rhino because actually they are going to make, they're going to run out of business because they're going to run out of rhinos. I believe we stand a chance of persuading them to stop killing our rhino if we give them an alternative product. Again, in this country we've got over 20 tons of horn. We could put that uh, to them over five or six or seven years while we build up our numbers of rhinos. I'm not advocating that we de-own all the rhinos in the country, not at all. But we have plenty of rhinos to supply that demand with, but eventually, if we continue with this trend, we will run out of rhinos and they will go extinct. John, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Phil, thank you, John. That was really interesting. Certainly, food for thought, John, but I've got a quick question for you, John. Do, do you not think that by creating, you know, opening the market, as, you, as you're saying, do you not think that we're going to create too much demand, that we won't be able to supply that demand, and then people get greedy and they want more and more horn than what we can supply? I don't believe that will be the case. You know, human nature, it's, it's more attractive to be a pirate than to join the Navy. And making it illegal does not make the demand smaller than a legal supply. So I don't buy that one. But our problem is we're running out of rhino and we're running out of time. So we have to do something different to what we've done. And if it doesn't work, you can stop it. Again, I say if we talk to that demand and said, listen, man, we can supply you this way. Stop killing the very animal that is going to supply you with business in five years' time. I think they may listen to us. But currently, we say we're not going to sell you one goddamn horn ever. What does that help? He's going to deal with the poachers, which is what he does. So to me, it's common sense. It's very sad, gentlemen. Very, very sad. Estimates on how many rhinos are left in Africa? Well, we estimate over 20,000, but that may be uh, too optimistic. We are waiting for a count in the Kruger Park. There are all these rumours that we don't have 10,000 rhinos in the Kruger Park anymore. God forbid that they less. It would be wonderful if they counted them and there were 12,000. But we will be very lucky to have over 20,000 rhinos left in Africa. It's more likely to be less. John Hume, Phil Hattam, thank you so much, gentlemen. Much appreciated. Much. It was very, very interesting.